Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your days to join us for this webinar. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. This was the title we gave you, but uh, we are gonna talk about the alternative language policy. We're also gonna talk about new educational resources uh, that are essentially a collection of illustrations. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about subpart E. Um, it, Donna and I are gonna split the time and uh, we are gonna ask for participation uh, from the group. So um, I hope you guys are all prepared. There is gonna be a fast fire response required in the chat box. So midway through, just to keep things moving. But we're really happy that you took the time to be with us today. Next slide. Uh, Donna's advancing slides, if that's not obvious. All participants are muted. Um, there will be time for questions and discussions at the end of the meeting for sure. And like I mentioned, we will be asking you to put responses into the chat box. Um, and you can raise your hand and, and we can unmute you to ask questions as well. This session is being recorded and the presentation will be shared via the listserv and on our website after the call. Today's topics, as I mentioned, next slide, Donna, there you go. Uh, we're going to talk about the alternative language delivery policy, which we've been working on for a while and have asked several people to pilot who have asked us uh, to make this change. We're going to talk about the More Than Words uh, Produce Safety Illustration Project, and that's really been uh, an effort that Gretchen originally proposed. It's been in collaboration with the Local Food Safety Collaborative, uh, but Don and I have been really involved. As you guys remember, we went through a couple of maternity leaves last year, one for uh, Gretchen and one for Donna. And so we kind of been passing that project back and forth. And then lastly, uh, Donna's gonna cover some subpart E proposed rule activities that the PSA is doing, give you some heads up of things to come and uh, take questions there. Next slide. So starting off with the policy, why a new policy uh, was, even enacted? Why did we move this way? We got a lot of feedback from folks and it became clear that our current policy was limiting grower participation or was not allowing trainers to be as effective as they wanted to be during trainings. And in the end, it came down to this, this policy, which is that all participants must receive training in a language they understand. And our policy required that you had to deliver the the training in a language that we had a manual that matched, okay? And as you know, currently we only have translations of the manual in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese. And what ends up happening here is that, first of all, translations are extremely expensive to do and extremely labor intensive. Uh, PSA doesn't have the funding to do it. We do and are working with colleagues who have funding from FSOPs or other places to do translations, but it became clear that we don't have the capacity, nor does anyone else have the capacity to translate the manual into every language that every grower speaks. Okay, so the first problem there is that growers that don't uh, speak the languages we have would be cut out by this policy. So that was a problem. The other problem was that, um, was that some growers don't read. So now you have to have a manual in a language that you, you can't actually read that manual anyway. So that's limiting their participation. And then on top of that, you have to have the ability to provide services for growers that don't speak the languages you have, that don't read the languages you have, but still need this training. If they're subject to the rule, they have to have a training that meets 112.22c. So, so that's what we were looking at. Next slide. So what we think this will help with is addressing these language and literacy barriers to make training available to a wider audience. It will allow trainers um, trainings to be conducted in a language, verbal and written, that is best for the audience. It is likely to increase uh, planning and organizational effort for trainings in order to deliver a high quality training. We have been very fortunate, let me say this, I'm not worried about this because we've been very fortunate to have dedicated trainers pilot this policy and evaluate it with us. So I think it's doable. I don't think it's so onerous that it can't be done, but I do wanna highlight that because if you're doing a training with multiple different languages, or if you're doing a training with interpretation, 
you have to work with the folks doing the interpretation to make sure they understand the scientific terminology. So you have to plan ahead for that. And you have to have people who are willing to work with you to make sure that those words are translatable into whatever language you are using. And I just wanna put that out there because I think it's good to give people a heads up. Next slide, please, Donna. Here you can see the policy is now up on our website. You can see it's version one, January of 2022. And Donna is going to talk more about the issue of it being version one in that we're still willing to take comment if something needs changed. The other thing I want to mention is that in this policy, it is long, but we have given you very specific helpful tips, if you will, on how to make it successful if you're going to use it. So we've tried to put in everything we think you will need to, to be successful. Um, we certainly are here, Donna's going to talk about that, to help you as it gets implemented. But again, if there's any comments, if something is not clear, if you go to use it and it doesn't work, just let us know. Um, the reason we changed the policy is because people had trouble. So let us know if the new version doesn't work. We're pretty sure it will because it's been piloted, but if it doesn't, let us know. Next slide. So what are the details of the policy? I just wanna go over the three options real quickly. I don't wanna linger on it too much. Option one is that you have a training where one or more of the participants, maybe the training's in English, but your participants prefer to have a manual in Spanish because that's their primary language or the language they read better. That participant now can take a training in English and be given a Spanish manual if that's what they need. Could be the same with Portuguese, could be the same with Chinese, that if they read better in one language, you can now mix the manuals that you have at a training, as long as the participants all understand the delivery language, which in the case I'm using as an example is English, right? So that's option one. Option number two is that all participants and trainers are bilingual and prefer an alternative, alternative language for delivery and discussion. The example here is we got a call, two different groups actually called us. One was a group where the trainer is Italian, the trainer trains in Italy, um, all the participants understand English, can read English. So they have English manuals, but they wanna do the training in Italian, right? So they're using English slides, but they're, they're talking in Italian as the delivery. The other one where this came up were, uh, were some plain grower communities that they all understand English, but they wanna have discussions in Pennsylvania Dutch, right? So this allows participants and trainers to use an English manual, but deliver the training in an alternative language that more people are comfortable with. The key here is, is that all the participants have to know the alternative language of delivery. So you would not wanna do this if you had five participants that only understand English, but you intend to deliver everything in Pennsylvania Dutch or Italian. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So this one, it's sort of like all participants agree, we wanna speak a different language, the presentation needs to be in a different language, but we all can read that English manual or whatever the language of the manual is. Option three is participants are unable to understand the delivery language and or the written language of the approved PSA manual. So here you have one or more participants with limited literacy or who need interpretation to attend the training. This gives you the opportunity to have interpretation during the meeting to give people a manual that they may not be able to read. Um, I will tell you that when we evaluated this, even people with limited literacy liked getting a printed manual, whether it's somebody at home that reads or somebody at the farm that reads, whatever the deal is, we still require, we still require, this is very important because we just had an issue this morning, we still require that all participants get a printed manual, okay? So that's still a requirement. What language that printed manual is, is, is where there's some flexibility, okay? Next slide. Okay. So I'm gonna, I was gonna turn it over to Donna for this next one. She's gonna talk about piloting the policy. Excellent, thanks Betsy. Mm -hmm. So Betsy mentioned that we worked with several individuals uh, or several groups of trainers, I should say, to pilot this policy. And um, the pilots, the four pilots that were hosted in the end, I think greatly strengthened the final version of this policy. Um, so 
it was piloted with four different courses. Three of those courses happened to be in Hmong only because that's who contacted us. Um, and then we had one group of Ukrainian participants. So um, in those Ukrainian participants, we they used option two, which if you remember from the previous slide was essentially um, the participants spoke pretty good English. They read English. It was with a university in the Ukraine. Um, however, they preferred to um, have clarification, have that discussion in Ukrainian, um, and they didn't need a translator or an interpreter because they all also spoke English. And in reviewing those evaluations from the participants, one of the number one threads that we saw was that those participants were grateful to be able to clarify in their native language. So the example that came up a couple of times was drop covered produce, everybody's favorite example. Um, and they specifically said, look, you know, it was great that this was offered in English, but we appreciated that we were able to converse with each other, um, had that discussion to really nail down and understand some of those difficult regulatory terms. Um, for the Hmong trainings, all three of those trainings we're really using option three that Betsy mentioned. And in this option, it's when those uh, participants really did not uh, speak or read in English. They still received an English language manual. Um, and we received really good evaluations from those participants. And one of the, the key threads that we saw there was that they were just really appreciative that the, um, that the grower training course was offered to them, that they A, were able to receive the training and that B, they were also able to receive that PSA ACTO certificate of completion. Um, and then that they were also kind of asked for their input and on how they thought the training went. And you'll see in this blurb here on the second part of the slide, I highlighted a success story that Annalisa Haltzberg wrote uh, for the North Central region. Um, and it was about one of those pilot Hmong language courses. And I wanted to highlight Annalisa here because um, she had a, a lot of uh, thoughts and she had a really big say in how the final version of the policy ended. And um, I will let Annalisa, I don't know if she had anything to say. She is joining us today. Um, she's in the participants. So Annalisa, if you wanted to chime in, feel free to. Um, I will say that, um, when you guys do, if anybody's interested in using the policy, when you review it toward the bottom, it is a pretty long policy, but toward the bottom, there is a whole section of best practices. Betsy highlighted some of those. They are things like making sure you allow additional time because if you are using interpretation, it can often double or more the length of time that actually presenting the training takes. Um, discussing some of those regulatory terms in advance and having a plan for how discussion is going to happen. So a lot of those regulatory best practices directly came from these pilot courses. Um, when we evaluated both the participants and the trainers, we also asked the trainers for their input. So yeah, Annalisa, I don't know if you have anything, any, any comments to say. Uh, I would just confirm that they were very happy to get the written manual in English. Um, some of them read English, some of them didn't, but they said that they had family members who would be able to read it and they would use it as a reference afterwards. So uh, we were a little hesitant to, you know, to provide the written manual, um, you know, about the utility of doing that, but they were very happy to get that. Um, and I would just also say leave enough time, you know, leave enough prep time and then also allow for I mean, in our case, it was it took twice as long to deliver the training. So in some ways it became a completely different training, which was totally fine and actually pretty exciting. It was really nice to kind of change it up, um, but it, it did look quite different and that's okay. But just to, to kind of expect that from the beginning. Thanks, Annalisa. There was a question in the Q&A um, asking if Hmong attendees had a trainer that spoke Hmong. And I will say in all three, there were three different um, Hmong trainings that happened across the country. Um, in all of those circumstances, there were trainers or interpreters. Um, so in some cases, there was a mix of trainers who native, or they spoke Hmong natively um, so that they were able to deliver the module in Hmong. And in those examples, uh, they had an interpreter that was able to translate from Hmong back into English so that the other trainers understood the questions that were being asked. Um, yeah. 
Okay, any other questions here? So with that, I'm gonna walk through some of the nuts and bolts. If any of you joining today are interested in using this policy, um, I wanted to highlight where you can do so because from our perspective in PSA, we are still, even though it is a, a policy that's up on our website, uh, we expect that there might be some changes that have to be made. Um, Betsy highlighted that this is version one. So we do ask that you make sure you notate when you register the course that you are going to be using this policy. And I can show you here how to do so. Um, I expect most of you are familiar with this course registration um, web form. And uh, the, the link is up here on the website. Um, you can access this through the PSA website. So when you register a course, uh, this is the top of the form that you're probably familiar with. And now there is an additional couple of options when, it, um, when you're answering that primary language question. And if you're interested in using this policy, you are going to select that last option, which is other language in consultation with PSA, because there are some additional steps to be done. So we would request that Anybody using this policy, let us know. Um, I have my email address on the next page and you can reach out to us um, for some additional guidance. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so we mentioned that we do really welcome additional comments, um, especially we've noticed when getting into that option three where participants are not speaking or reading one of the languages that the, the translation, um, that the manual is translated into, there, there's a lot of additional steps and that's where those best practices come in. So please, if you have additional comments, we would welcome them. We do try to make sure that our policies are flexible and transparent and are um, making sure that they're getting the best outcomes for the participants. And that's the whole reason we went through this pilot process is we wanna make sure that the PSA Grow training courses are available to as many people as possible, and also that they're being effective and um, we're seeing good outcomes from these trainings. So please do let us know. Um, and I added, I'll be the contact person. So I added my, my um, email address there. And again, I know this policy does seem long. So if you have questions about it, maybe you are thinking, you're not even planning a course yet, you're just thinking about how you might go about using this policy for a course, please don't hesitate to email, email me. Um, and I'm happy to walk you through that policy, help you figure out which option might be best for you, um, and then give you some additional suggestions on, on um, again, making this effective. Okay, so with that, I am uh, going to turn this back over to Betsy. Thanks, Anna. Um, okay, so we're shifting gears. So um, if, you, if you have any questions about the last thing, let us know uh, about the policy, do let us know. Otherwise, we are moving on to the more than words and this is where you're gonna have to participate. So just queuing you guys up for that. Um, this project, really came about because of realizing that there's a lot of topics that we teach in the Produce Safety Alliance that are pretty difficult to convey. Um, and in a survey and talking to our uh, ad hoc committee, uh, we asked for ideas on which topics to prioritize. And we do have a second year of this. So, so we are working on a second set, but Essentially, we came up with a set of, of topics. We worked with the illustrator, Annie Mas Mat Matzik. Sorry, I'm messing up her last name. I, she was supposed to be joining us. I didn't actually see if she was on. Is she on the line? She is, okay. the she is, she is here. So welcome, Annie, uh, to the call. We worked with Annie uh, to share these ideas. And then as an illustrator, she took a lot of the ideas and gave us different versions to choose from. The topics we included were things on worker training, cleaning and sanitation and post-harvest practices. There were 10 illustrations in year one. And uh, what we would like to do is, is talk a little, the next slide is about why illustrations. So we'll get that slide. Um, illustrations are a good way to communicate concepts without the use of text. So not that these are solely for limited literacy audiences, but it really does provide an opportunity to 
think about the material in a different way. Um, we talk about in our adult learning module, different people have different abilities, different ways of learning. A lot of people are visual learners. So this, this works for a lot of different people. And it really was intended to supplement the grower training course. Personally, after seeing these, they can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think we have a, a couple of questions coming up later for you guys about other ways these might be used. But really what it's meant to do is help attendees visualize these food safety concepts. Think about what it looks like on the farm. Are these helping you understand what we mean when we give you certain ideas? Um, and again, it might be helpful for low literacy. We're hoping it will be. And for those that speak different languages where translation is a little bit of an issue, but, um, but really I think they're gonna be useful for a lot of folks. So this is where I wanna cue you up. What we're gonna do is the next slide, the next 10 slides are gonna actually be the illustrations. So break out the chat box or prepare to raise your hand. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna quickly go through these. And the question I want you to answer in the chat box is, what does this, illustra <laughs> this illustration mean? Okay, so, so quickly, those of you, a lot of you are, are trainers, PSA trainers. What we wanna know is, what is this illustration trying to highlight? Okay, so we're gonna see how well we did. Uh, this, as I told Don, it's always risky doing something like this because it could be a crash and burn, <laughs> but, um, but I don't think it will be. So is everybody ready? Give me a, a, a thumbs up or a yes, we're ready in the chat box if you're even listening or not checking email. Okay, <laughs> great. Fantastic, thank you guys. Um, image number one, Donna. What is this one? We should have we should have offered to send you PSA um, PSA awards if you could cite the actual um, provision in the rule. <laughs> What's this one telling us, folks? Don't pick <laughs> no poop. Don't harvest. Drop produce. Yes, good. Drop. Yep. Okay, fantastic. So you guys are picking up several. Yes. Okay. So several of things are coming in the chat box. One is do not harvest produce that is likely to be contaminated, right? So that's number one. The other one is there are drops on the ground, right? So in the notes, we actually have something about the drops on the ground. Um, somebody mentioned don't lean too far over on the ladder. We do have the issue of there being dirt on the ladder rungs. And what if somebody climbs the ladder like this as opposed to climbing the ladder on the side, right? So keeping your hands from getting contaminated. No visual contamination, yep. Good, fantastic, that's all we wanted. You're right on board. Next one, Donna. What's this one? Wearing white after June. <laughs> yep, right off the bat. Yep, as you know, growers, um, there's a requirement that workers know how to inspect containers to see if they're damaged, to see if they're contaminated. Of course, if they're damaged or contaminated, they have to know what to do with them. You can see here on the left, the clean bins are stacked up. The, the ones that are busted are over to the right. Perfect. Excellent. Good job. Next one. What's this one? landmine. No harvest buffer zones. Great. Yep. Yep. So remember, again, going back to somewhat similar to the, to the first one you saw, people have to be a harvest, uh, employees have to be trained to not harvest produce that is likely to be contaminated. One of the options is establishing you know, no harvest buffer zones so people don't harvest contaminated produce, right? Look at all the deer tracks. You guys are seeing that, um, seeing uh, some piles of feces. Very good. Next one. Yep, yep, so, 
So uh, as you know, you have to clean and when appropriate and necessary sanitize materials. So this one is really meant to capture um, a couple of different things. Anyone wanna, wanna, wanna pick out some of the attributes of this and, and some of the things that we may be highlighted to, uh, to help this along? SOP, how to use an SOP. Yep, a log is required, that's great. Signposted to show procedures, it's five o'clock. How to clean at the end of, you guys are getting all of them. Great, <laughs> great job, great job. The other one is the personal wearing PPE. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, that, that was, I looked up and that was just what I was gonna say. So yeah, proper PPE, making sure workers are protected, how to wash, rinse and sanitize, all of those things. Um, how to know when things are clean, making sure things are separated, all of that. The other thing that's highlighted here is if you use reusable gloves, right? Keeping them clean and all of that. So perfect. Thank you. Next. I hope this is fun. <laughs> Next one, Donna. What's this one? Yep. Cleaning equipment, cleaning harvesting equipment. Okay. Now, so hopefully, um, very similar theme to what the last one was, but hopefully what you're getting here is the variation in operation size maybe, right? So different, different, little, different operation, different tools, different equipment, um, trying to get, um, yes, clean equipment, washing isn't sanitizing, of course. But, but the deal is, is to highlight that cleaning and sanitizing are important no matter the size of the operation, right? And you can see here, there's a field over there that's supposed to be harvested. You can see we're a ways off of the field. So we're worried about not contaminating fields or, or cleaning and sanitizing in areas where you're not gonna cause contamination. Um, again, the PPE that we're seeing there. So yeah, absolutely, great. Next one. I like the use of a scrub brush instead of a pressure washer. Well, let me say they use a pressure washer out there too. Here's an interesting one. Anyone want to guess what this is? Certainly something we've been talking a lot about lately. Yep, you got it, Stephanie. Cleaning in dry environments, right? And, um, you know, in a normal operation, you maybe would not see all three of these folks at the same time cleaning, but it is really meant to um, highlight what that would look like. You know, step one, removing those big materials. Step two, using it as a cleaner. And then step three, using a sanitizer, uh, which is an alcohol. Now you'll notice there are words on this slide. And we did ask uh, the group that served as the focus group to review these, you know, if we could use words. The key thing was to keep them very limited, right? To not use sentences, to not use a lot of complex terms. So I just want to point that out that, that there are words on this, but, um, but those are highlights. So great. Uh, the writing of alcohol sanitizer is a little difficult to see, maybe just the size of my screen. Thanks, Stephanie, for that feedback. All right, next. What's this one? One of my favorites. <laughs> Zones, okay. Kind of is zones, but it's more than that. Ensuring all parts are clean, inspecting equipment, hard to reach areas, all of those things, right? So you can see here, we've highlighted rollers, brushes, the spray nozzles, the, the conveyor belt, the welds, right? All of these things where we can have hygienic design. Thanks, Annalisa, for that. Places where biofilms may form, exactly. The hard to reach places, what you're doing on an inspection, what are those niches, and, um, and all of that. Perfect, you guys are great. I'm feeling good about this. Next one. What's this one? Donna, jump in if I'm not doing a good job with the high flow, but what's this one about? Batch water, flume washing, bing, 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 water change schedule. Thank you, Ollie. 
you are required to have a schedule to change your water. So what does that look like, right? You can use turbidity, you can just change it, keeping track of that record keeping on the wall, um, but making sure that happens. All right, what's an NTU? NTU is the unit used to measure turbidity. And it stands for net, net, I can't even pronounce it. It's a long word, net, net. I just can't get anybody for now. I can, I'll type it in the chat box when we're done with this, I apologize. I literally have never heard it said out loud. I can probably spell it more than I can say it. Um, thank you. There you go. Net, net, net. Nephilometric. Nephilometric. It's like Hermione. I, I don't know as ever I've ever said it out loud. So thank you for that, Rob. All right. Next one. This one is one of my favorites. I like them all, but this one I just think is, is really interesting. Thoughts on this one? Zones, good. Good product, good flow of product, right? Mapping flow, post-harvest flow, yep. Avoiding cross-contamination, yep. Okay, so we talked about hard concepts, right? Segregation of activities, yep, all of these things. So we talked about those hard concepts. This one hits a ton of concepts, a ton of concepts in this. So the notes for this are gonna be very interesting. Um, but you can see actually, there's one here that I don't think we've seen in the chat box. There's one that you guys haven't gotten. You've gotten a lot of them. Um, flow, post-harvest flow, workflow. There's another, there's another really sort of hidden one here. Transport, yep, that's another one. Drain in the floor, yep, you're getting it. The other one is covered and uncovered produce. Not uncovered, not covered produce. So covered and not covered produce. Um, so yeah, things like keeping boxes off the floor, having a drain, you can see the call bin, you can see her separating the dirty um, incoming, packing into clean boxes. You can see the gentleman um, moving the, the product in that singular flow. But on the bed of the tractor is produce is not covered and going across the thing is covered. So you could talk about the need to clean and sanitize if they're not handled in the same way or running covered produce first and then running product that's not covered um, over, over the top or secondarily. So a lot of concepts here. Next one. You guys are doing great. Thank you for this. Really appreciate the participation. Yep. This is the last one. Oh, it's the last one. This one, the last one. Okay. What's this one? <laughs> Avoid condensation dripping. Good. Thank you, Jacob. Don't store your stuff under an AC unit. Fantastic. Keep your stuff away from the wall. Yep. Good cooler management. Off the floor storage. Drains close to condensation. Great. Fantastic. All right. Thank you guys for participating. I'm going to turn it over to Donna so she can tell you more about what we're doing. Excellent. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, so I loved that activity that we just did. And I also will say, I thought it was funny when Betsy said, guess which provision, as if any illustration has a singular provision. Um, I think in working, working for the teaching notes for that big produce flow one, I think there were like eight or so different teaching notes. So, um, but the next thing I wanted to talk about is what is going to accompany these illustrations as looking at as a resource. And it would not be a PSA product if we did not send you along with a bunch of teaching notes. Um, and this is what we are doing currently in wrapping up year one of the project. So um, each illustration is accompanied by an illustration guide and teaching notes. I think you guys did a great job of highlighting. Um, I think you caught most of the the teaching notes that I've, I've been writing down um, for each of these. And uh, on the right hand side here is an example. So this is the no harvest, what we call the no harvest buffer zone illustration. 
Um, and you'll see that each of the teaching notes are accompanied, they're, they're labeled. So you can see teaching note one or teaching point one corresponds with that number one in the illustration guide. And this is again, as a trainer, we're trying to make it as easy to use as possible um, for, these, for these resources. They also have relevant FISMA resources or references um, and a suggestion location for use if you are going to be using these in a PSA grower training course. Some of these, such as the dry cleaning resource, also have um, supporting resources that are listed just because we want people, maybe it's a newer concept for them, we want to um, provide as much information as we can while making it as easy to use as possible. Um, so with that, I have, a, I have a couple of poll questions for you. Um, now that you have seen round one of those illustrations, um, let me see, I'm gonna launch the poll and there are two different questions. The first one is in what format would you like to see the illustrations available? And I'll explain this a little bit after we're done the poll. Um, so a JPEG, which is like a photo format on a PowerPoint slide, like maybe a supplemental slide set for PSA. Um, other, you can comment in chat or all of the above. And then question two is, if you were going to be using these, um, how would you use these illustrations during grower outreach? Um, as a supplement to PSA grower training slides, in slides for other trainings, other you know, non-Purdue Safety Alliance trainings, in printed materials or other, and please comment in chat, uh, or I don't plan to use them. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a few seconds to finish answering. In the chat box, they're asking for PDFs too. Okay, perfect. As others. Excellent. Okay, so um, let's see. Look, oh, let me share the results with you guys. Um, so it looks like many of you are interested in JPEGs, definitely on a PowerPoint slide, um, all of the above. And then how would you use the illustrations mostly during PSA Grow training slides, um, other slides, in printed materials, other. Okay. Ah, thanks, Alex. I, somebody said I need a multiple option choice for question number two. Um, perfect, in and out of training. Okay, so the reason we are asking this is because we currently, let's see, we currently have three of these illustrations, the first three that Betsy showed you up on the website, they're available to download and the teaching guides are there as well. Um, as we finalize the teaching guides for the remaining seven illustrations, we were just really interested in how people might be using them. We went into this project thinking they would be most helpful for PSA grower training courses. Um, however, we wanted, again, we want these to be used. So we thought we would ask you guys if there were additional suggestions that you had. And we will think about these as we finish building out this website, adding the additional teaching notes um, one of the things that we are looking at doing is putting these all in one uh, supplemental slide set. So of course you could just pick and choose which illustrations you want. And that way the teaching, those uh, teaching notes will be directly in the note section of each slide. Um, the other thing we're looking at doing is having a zip drive. So a one click um, link, you know, a download a little zip folder with each of those illustrations a PDF of the teaching notes, which I think Betsy highlighted, somebody commented in chat, as well as those supplemental PowerPoints. So again, thank you for the feedback. We're just kind of looking at as we're next steps of finalizing year one illustrations. Uh, we just wanted to see what you guys would find helpful. Okay, so with that, um, I am gonna stop and see if anybody had questions or feedback about the policy, the alternative language policy, and the illustrations. Uh, you probably noticed that I did not ask for very much feedback as we finished the alternative language policy discussion, because honestly, I had no idea how long that activity was going to take, and I wanted to make sure to save time. Um, so I will stop here and see if anybody had 
questions or feedback on the policy. I know there's a lot of chatter in about the illustrations. Um, but the other thing I will ask is, is anybody planning on using this policy? And you can raise your hand if you want me to unmute you or you can comment in the chat box. Okay, yes, a couple of people said yes. Um, okay, Weston, yes, Hawaii will. Will you talk about PSA's policy? Oops. Uh, will you talk about PSA's policy on how you verify accurate translations that two independent systems, yep, translator system, excellent. So Weston, that gets into our translation policy. So, and Betsy, feel free to jump in if you have something to say. Um, as we're working with collaborators on translating, doing an approved translation of the PSA manual. Um, so currently that's in Spanish, Chinese, and Portuguese, as well as English. Uh, we are working with collabor collaborators on Ilocano and Korean. Um, that policy, we're making sure that, you know, the translations are accurate. So in addition to having a um, primary translator do the initial translation, uh, we require in that policy that there is a secondary review of that translation. And again, that's just for policy um, because we want it to be accurate, um, especially before we lay it out in, um, in PowerPoint presentation slides, in the PDFs, things like that. Yeah. So Weston, just to give you, a, and this is for everybody on the call, we talked about the alternative delivery policy, it's a totally different policy. This is about a uh, translation policy. But, but just to clarify this, because I know this is going on right now. What we have learned from doing four policy translations is that if we give it to one person and they do a translation and we don't have somebody as a secondary independent reviewer look at it, what happens is people may pick a word that isn't the best word for, to translate for a certain term. And what we found is that if a secondary translation person goes through it, we catch a lot of problems prior to layout. If we don't have a secondary person go through it, what happens is we launch it and then we find out when people are using it that it has all these problems. So when we develop this policy, this is why there's a secondary reviewer that's required to look at the primary reviewer. And typically what comes out of that what we get that comes out of that is a lot of discussion between the primary and the secondary reviewer over terminology, over her specific context, context of things. Um, I'll give you a for instance, uh, rooting. When we did the first translation in Spanish, the way they translated rooting, which was meant to be like a pig or an animal rooting in the field, was translated as rooting a plant, right? So that contextually, it wasn't what we had wanted it to be. And when we have these secondary reviewers, they clean up a lot of those mistakes. Now, every translation, doesn't matter what you do, has some mistakes. But what we found is if we don't do the secondary translation, we end up with a lot of mistakes. And so that's why the secondary translation is required. OK, sorry. I know that's a little diversion, but I did want to answer that question. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, and one other point before we move on, um, one other point that I wanted to highlight is earlier on, Annalisa uh, had a very important comment in the chat box. And she highlighted that another thing that really stood out to them when they piloted the uh, one of those Hmong courses is that it's important to have someone as a tech support who speaks the language of the participants. And um, this is when we get into that discussion about having interpreters, um, not only for interpreting the trainers, but also providing tech support for those participants, especially if you are doing a remote course, which I think adds an additional layer of, of, um, of difficulty. Um, the participants might want to call or text that person, so make sure um, that per participants have the phone number of the tech support person who speaks their language. And I know in several of the pilots who use this policy, they, um, they had a pretty large training team. Again, just more people, more hands on deck to help answer questions. Okay, perfect. Well, with that, I'm I am going- I would like Donna to ask, what do you guys think about the illustrations overall? Do you like the illustrations overall? Do you plan on using them? I know we've kind of bounced back and forth now, but 
I am really curious about the feeling about the illustrations. Do you think they'll be useful? Great, okay, that's super good news. And I do really appreciate uh, you guys participating in that feedback. I will tell you, uh, we're all super relieved on this side that you guys got all those details. <laughs> so really appreciate it. All right, fantastic. Go ahead, Donna, sorry to interrupt. No problem. And just a reminder, there was a question sent to me um, asking about timelines. Three of these are up and we are slowly just working on, you know, adding the rest of the teaching guide. So I, I would say these year ones, these 10 that you saw, pretty soon they're going to be up on the website available for use. Um, and then year two, we are working right now. Um, so they will also have a teaching guide very similar to this year one. Okay. So with that, I am going to switch gears a little bit. Um, we're going to move away from policy and resources and talk a little bit about the subpart E proposed rule. Um, as educators, we just wanted to highlight uh, for anybody not aware, uh, there is a new proposed rule to amend the agricultural water requirements in the FISMA produce safety rule. Um, that was released on December 6, 2022. And I wanted to highlight because this is an educators group uh, that we have created two supplemental slides for module 5.1 to alert participants and encourage them to comment on the proposed rule. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is try to really encourage people to send in constructive comments, things you liked about the rule, things you didn't like. Um, and Rob is dropping the two relevant hyperlinks into the chat box. So one is, in case you missed it, uh, the email, a link to the email that we sent out um, as trainers, what you can do about the proposed rule, um, how to continue teaching 5.1, how you might comment. Um, and then also a hyperlink to those two supplemental slides. We are working on developing additional resources on subpart E. Um, we do plan to host regional and Spanish language focus groups with growers, again, to help gather comments to submit to FDA. Um, and then also we are currently hosting calls for educators. We are calling these the subpart E office hours. And um, we have done two already. Essentially, we have gathered some subject matter experts, um, researchers, industry members um, in water, and um, we've been getting them together and then people call in and essentially ask questions. The idea is to discuss the proposed requirements, align educators. So these are very targeted to PSA trainers and other educators, not necessarily for growers. Um, but the idea here is to educate uh, is to align educators' understanding of the proposed rule and encourage participants, again, to submit comments. So there are two more English language office hours coming up. One is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. The registration is there and it's in the chat box as well. Um, and then the last office hour we're hosting is February 8th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we are currently working on uh, planning a Spanish language office hour as well. Okay, and with that, I'll see if there's any questions, um, but that you are familiar with the PSA website. Um, I do wanna highlight here that we do have the Spanish language website as well. And Davis and Ricardo and Laura have been very busy continuing to translate a lot of these resources into Spanish. We just had a discussion this morning about eventually translating the illustration teaching guide and whatnot into Spanish as well. So if I will take a moment and see if there are any other questions or comments before we wrap it up for the day. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, again, that was really fun for us. And we are very excited to get the rest of the illustrations to you out. And uh, as always, okay, um, as always, we will um, answer any questions that you have. So feel free to contact us. Thank you and have a nice day.